Good morning, my name is Neville Cole. I am the owner of this Mark 1 Air Airborne lifeboat. It is a superb specimen, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes. Um, now tell me, how can a lifeboat be airborne? It's well, a contradiction in terms. It is. Um, these were designed in 1943 uh, to aid air crew that were downed in uh, the Channel or uh, the Bay of Biscay or areas around any sort of part of our coast. Um, it was a conception um, designed by three individual people uh, who obviously all had individual connections with it. Um, the main constructor of the, the, the vessel was a gentleman called Uffa Fox. Now this was dropped from an, from an aircraft? It was, yes. What type of aircraft was it? Uh, the aircraft varied. Obviously the first aircraft to drop this um, air type of airborne lifeboat would have been the Lockheed Hudson, which is the, vehicle, uh, the aircraft that's actually on this plate here. Okay, that was a Mark I. Uh, the Mark 1A, which this boat is, um, was dropped by Vickers Warwick. And now everyone, gentlemen wise, would probably know the Vickers Wellington. Well, the Warwick was the bigger brother. Okay. It's and a lot from what altitude was it dropped? Um, the drop altitude was normally 700 feet. Now that's a long way to fall. Yes. Um, each individual boat was fitted with a plethora of parachutes. Now the parachutes were stored in, in, in sacks that are obviously um, fixed to a position on the boat. Uh, and these were opened obviously as the aircraft released the boat and the boat started to drop towards the ocean. So the boat falls down slowly? Yes, uh, well actually is. 19 miles an hour is a normal descent. That's not slow. It isn't, exactly. Um, so it's well built? It, it is, well it's, it's the construction of the boat, this one's uh, dual skinned, uh, the later ones which were 30 foot in length, this is 23, were triple skinned. Uh, but this is an internal um, 45 degree angle and then the external carvel built. So what happens the instant the boat hits the water? Well, before we get to that sort of stage, as the boat is originally released from the aircraft, um, if we come this way, uh, using this photograph as an example, on the central photograph there, you can see there are two large packs and a small center pack the size of a pillow. Okay, That small center pack is the drogue chute. That's the one that's attached to the aircraft. On release, that is actually uh, dispatched because it's dropped to the aircraft. That lifts up the two larger packs, which then deploys the six, six parachutes, 32 foot diameter, in each of three in each of those two packs. Uh, at that stage there, the boat will start to drop away, obviously supported by a plethora of parachutes. So we c we're in the air, coming down, we hit the water. Yeah. What happens then? Okay, well prior to that actually happening, we have three rockets on board of this boat. Rockets? Rockets, yes. Well, they're, they're actually safety rockets as such. Uh, one is in the bow. Uh, the one that's in the bow obviously uh, is connected to a drogue, which is basically a sea anchor. Okay. This is an anchor, that, isn't it? That's a bottomless bucket in theory, yes. So, as you can see, the water flow it works on a venturi system so that the water rushing into here basically can only pass out very slowly at the bottom which means that it will act as a brake. So how does that affect the boat while in the water? Well, what it will tend to do is to bring the boat so its nose is into wind but also stop its drift or it will slow its drift considerably. So the rocket yep. automatically yes. fires, yep. is it out of that hole? It would be in two water tubes that would be oh, here. There would be two here. tubes there. Right. If you look into the sea. Looking at the picture there, there are the two water tubes. Oh, right. Yeah, okay, those two tubes. Uh, the drogue is stored in the port one and the rocket is stored in the starboard one. And it pulls out this that, behind that, it. That taking out which 50 falls yards. into the sea. Yes, taking 50 yards of rope with it, which obviously falls into the sea eventually to create the sea anchor. And that keeps the boat facing? Into wind. Into so, that, wind. so obviously it will drift but very slowly. Uh, but really bringing the nose into wind. So what's next? Well, once the boat actually is waterborne, we have another two rockets of the same design that are actually um, fitted amidships and a picture to describe what they would look like would be the centre picture there where the gentleman is obviously um, looking at the operation of the message carrier. Now, what do those do? Well, those two rockets, when fired, uh, which is the, the firing of those rockets is caused by this unit here, which is an immersion switch. Now, that immersion switch is bolted to the underside of the keel, and uh, it operates like a normal light switch would be, where power comes in until the, the sol soluble plug that's inside here dissolves. There's no power going through the switch, but as soon as that dissolves, the power comes in, comes back out, which then comes up via another wire, to set off these two rockets. Now these rockets would fire in port to port and starboard. So um, they go directly that way and yep. the other one goes directly 
that that way. Right, yeah. So to port and starboard, and each rocket is attached to a um, 175 yard of buoyant rope, uh, which is glued to uh, in, on two cardboard pack boxes that are sat on the top of these two tunnels. And what is the function of that? Well, that's basically to give the gentleman on board a lifeline to uh, grab hold of and retrieve themselves to the boat. So that would float behind the boat. No, they would, should float in line with the boat, hopefully. In line with the boat. Yeah, and it'd be, and be dragged. And any air crew in the water can hold on to that yes. and pull themselves towards the inwards. boat. Yeah. If we imagine that we are in a dinghy and the dinghy is to the forward of us, we're now obviously being held in, uh, hopefully, in a slower position, drift position, than what the dinghy would travel. Although the dinghy is travelling in our same direction, it may actually veer off quite considerably. If it veers off, then hopefully somewhere along that 175 yards of rope, they will be have a point of being able to grab hold of it and then pull themselves towards the lifeboat. Now, this item here interests me immensely. Just what is this? That unit there? Well, that's actually a kite. Okay. As the, in, a, we a have kite, today? A flying kite, yes. yes. Right. Okay. This particular one actually is a little bit different than normal. Uh, this one is actually propelled into the air by a um, rocket. Another rocket? Another rocket, yes, yes. Or a firework, but without sparkles. Yes, yes. Okay. Now, the principle of that is that you use that to um, operate in conjunction with this item, which is a dinghy transmitter. Uh, this is a hang ground um, transmitter, basically, you turn up the handle and you sort of grind the handle like you would do if you were coffee uh, at a certain revolution it automatically keys SOS obviously if you want to tape another message you can actually put it into whatever position you want by tuning the buttons and then you can key any message by Morse by that key but automatically SOS SOS so even if you're, in, you're ill and you can't operate yep SOS yes as long as it's ground it should contact you supply the SOS message phenomenal okay inside here that reel there's 200 foot of like a Bowden cable which is the basic metrical uh, metal aerial that will be connected to that rocket once the rocket has been fired so the rocket takes the aerial yep. high up into the sky correct to give a wider transmission range exactly Wow, and uh, what do we have here? Uh, well, these are items that would have been stored on the boat uh, as victualled, basically to supply uh, sustenance to the crew. Now, this one here? Uh, that's the later kite. That's actually a box kite of an American design. A smaller version to that? In theory, yes, but this is hand-launched. Right. This one you would obviously construct on the deck of the boat and chuck high, hopefully being caught in the wind to transfer. And here we've got... Um, rations? Yes, these are flying rations. Um, on the boat itself, there would have been originally 49 cans of water. Okay, three drinking cups, uh, there would have been three tins of matches, um, there would have been three tins of cigarettes, and seven tins of flying rations. Who would put cigarettes in a survival pack today? No one. No one. Sure. Not suggestible. <laughs> Not suggestible. <laughs> is it? No. And uh, what's in here? Oh, well, this is an airborne lifeboat first aid kit. This is a kit from the actual boat itself, um, and in this kit would be uh, instruction, obviously, on what actually is in there, plus a full range of items. That, um, That's pretty complete, it isn't is, it? It is, yes. Wow. Phenomenal. Now, I see uh, an engine here. You do. And also, I see another engine over here making yep. two engines. Yes, this vessel was fitted with two engines. Uh, both these engines are of a, um, what's classed as an inboard outboard. So, in theory, any boater of small engined uh, vessels will re probably recognize this because it's a pull start two-stroke engine uh, but this was designed uh, in the 30s but utilized in the 40s so that it could actually be bolted down through the hull of the boat um, so that this unit here would fit here into yes. that area where this wooden plank is uh, plated here that would have been removed and as you can see there's a series of bolts here that would actually locate onto those positions so in theory the engine would be inside the vessel but the propeller and the skeg would be below the hull itself an example of a picture of what the engines look like together in their position is there, the lower photograph. Okay, and to give an idea of how the propellers looked on protruding from the underside of the hull is that photograph there, where you can see both propellers and the skegs actually be thrown below the hull of the boat. Now this boat is open it's an open boat, isn't it? It, it is, to a degree. So, uh, how would that fare in a storm? Was ah. there any uh, 
any extras? There was, yes. I think there is, isn't there? There is, yes, yes. Um, when the boat was constructed, what they wanted to do was supply a vessel that could be sailed by, say, most people. As you can imagine, most people have no experience whatsoever on sailing small boats, including myself. But obviously what they also wanted to do is design something that would actually withstand the majority of the weather that was thrown around the UK and obviously out to the Bay of Biscay. So when originally constructed, this is a model, an original model of um, the vessel, basically how she would be constructed. Um, on the model itself, as you can see, we have the position of the two rockets that we described earlier. Okay, and what we have here are effectively two canvas covers that are protective covers for a buoyancy chamber um, at bow and stern which are inflated on the descent. So yet more automatic? More automatic, yes. yes. And that was presumably filled by a it's, bottle? Yep. It um, could be this one here? This is correct. Well this is an example of, but not the correct bottle. This is actually an oxygen bottle. It would have been CO2, a CO2 gas, uh, and that gas is released into two flat lilos in theory that once inflated would produce basically a self-lighting lifeboat. So if you are able to view that from that angle, what we would effectively have so is to... You can to see the, the, uh, the engines there, Yes, right? you can, yes. That's a fairly complete model. Beautiful, isn't it? Mm. And but there's a mast over there. Yes, the, the vessel was, um, had three metho methods of propulsion. Um, apart from the two engines, which would you would class as mechanical, you also have a, a 16 foot mast with two sails, which were already filled around the mast so that no one had to bother trying to actually assemble that. As you can see by the model, uh, that's not very tight. It would have been tighter than that, but in theory, that's what would happen. The sails would be automatically wrapped around the mast. Um, you also had seven, sorry, four seven foot oars, which were literally laid and strapped along this edge of the deck. So, almost incomprehensible how it all works. It is, yes. It is alchemy. If it you, is. Yes, yes, it is so alchemy. So, in one or two sentences, the aircraft drops the boat, Yep. the parachutes deploy, then uh, it lands in the water, the rockets, the rock, the drogue is fired out uh, once the boat is waterborne, the two side rockets fire out, firing out, taking lifelines with them. And obviously then once the men are able to pull themselves on board, they have ancillary items to keep them sustenance. Then it's got the food. Yeah. And also protective. The radio. And protective clothing. Protective clothing, first aid, and then they inflate the... No, nope. uh, no the, the inflation of the cylinders, by the cylinders, is oper actually operating when they the boat is dropped from the aircraft. All automatic? All automatic. I mean, today you would need several pages of computer code. You would, and yeah. And this is all basically done by what timed it? Uh, how, uh, how do you mean? What just In what order? I mean, how did it? It was, no, it, was, it, was, it was done by things happening, wasn't it? It was. Hitting the sea, the water entering the, the switch. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, this all happened in the, between 700 feet and waterborne, so that approximately takes le less than 19 seconds. But in that time, um, various items have happened. So on release from the aircraft, the small parachute pack uh, is de de deployed. That lifts up the larger pack. At the same time, we have a level switch that produces electrical current to a battery. As soon as that battery is actually live, it fires the, the bow rocket. As soon as that rocket has been dispatched, um, operating cables that are connected to the parachute straps, um, they pierce, they pull these uh, acons that are here, Steve which then basically pulls the cable, pushes the pin down here, pierces the disc, releases the CO2 bottle, which inflates two buoyancy chambers. Um, this is all happening. As soon as we now become uh, waterborne, the immersion switch then fires, um, obviously operates, sorry, which fires the two rockets. And then within seconds of that happening also, uh, there's another electrical charge that goes up to a position apex at the center of the parachute cluster which then should release those parachutes to stop them operating as a sea anchor. Unbelievable. Yep. Let's just look at these photographs here before we end. And it's all here, isn't it? Yeah. And 
this one is how it would have looked, isn't it? That's it, yeah. Wow, yeah. what can you say? All I can say is thank you very much. That's quite all right. And from my point of view, this is one of the most amazing historical exhibits I've ever seen in my life. Thank you. And it, it should be in a bigger museum. It should be seen by a lot of people. There are, there are vessels, obviously, of this type in various museums around the UK. Unfortunately, this is the only one in Devon. Um, and this is here, basically, on the grace of friends of ours. Yes. Um, I own the boat, but this thing is larger than my garden. Yes, so, um, yeah. Well, what can I say? Absolute thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.